subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button Good evening. Welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Yeshi Chanzam. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you on Thursday, the 24th of March. India stands for peace. No question of linking Russia-Ukraine conflict to trade issues, says Foreign Minister. Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan appeals for support to March 27 power show ahead of no trust vote. And. Sri Lankan struggle to obtain food and fuel amid rising inflation. And now for all the details. Indian Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar on Thursday said that India's foreign policy decisions are made in national interest and the country calls for immediate cessation of violence in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Reacting to questions on U.S. describing India's position as somewhat shaky, for not imposing sanctions on Russia and its implications on trade, Jay Shankar said there is no question of linking the Ukraine situation to issues of trade. India's foreign policy decisions are made in national interests and guided by the belief that the international order must respect territorial integrity and sovereignty of states. India's Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar said on Thursday, adding that New Delhi calls for immediate cessation of violence in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Responding to a question in the parliament on U.S. President Joe Biden describing India's position as somewhat shaky among the Quad countries against the Russian invasion and its possible implications on the India-U.S. trade, Jay Shankar said there is no question of linking the Ukraine situation to issues of trade. India's position is based on six principles, including that of peace, dialogue and diplomacy, he said, adding that India is in touch with leadership of both Russia and Ukraine. Indian foreign policy decisions are made in Indian national interest. And we are guided by our thinking, our views, our interests. So there is no question of linking the Ukraine situation to issues of trade. India is the only major country close to the United States not to have condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine or imposed any sanctions on it. Over the past decade, India has grown closer to the United States in the face of a resurge in China across the border. But Russia, its Cold War ally, remains its biggest arms supplier. Chief Minister of India's East and West Bengal State, Mamta Banerjee, on Thursday visited Bhuktui village in Birbhum district where eight people were charged with death after violence erupted over the murder of a political leader of ruling party. Banerjee met the families of the victims and vowed strict actions against those involved. Chief Minister of India's Eastern West Bengal State, Mamta Banerjee, on Thursday visited Bhaktui village in Birbhum district where eight people were charged to death. The victims reportedly including two children died on Tuesday after their houses were set on fire in Rampurhat area of the district after the alleged murder of Bhadu Sheikh, a leader of the state's ruling TMC, Trinamool Congress Party. Banerjee met the families of the victims and announced financial aid for the affected families and for rebuilding burnt houses. She also offered jobs to the members of the affected families. The chief minister said that police will probe all angles whether the incident had involvement of locals or were there people who came from outside. Describing the killings as heinous, Indian Prime Minister on Wednesday said those responsible for them should not be forgiven. Mamta Banerjee's government has set up a special investigation team to probe the incident. However, India's ruling BJP Bharatiya Janata Party has demanded a central investigation, the sacking of Mamta Banerjee and President's rule. Earlier, TMC delegation led by lawmaker Sudeep Bandopadhyay on Thursday met Interior Minister Amit Shah at the parliament and urged him to remove the West Bengal governor in view of the Birbhum incident. Bandopadhyay said that 21 persons have been arrested so far and 15 police officials have been asked to go on leave. He added, no guilty person will be spared. In news from Pakistan. 
As Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan is set to face a no-confidence motion in the parliament on Friday, he has called upon the entire nation to participate in his ruling PTI party's power show on March 27. Khan had earlier said he will not resign at any cost and will fight till the last. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan on Thursday in a video message appealed citizens to support his ruling PTI party's power in Islamabad on March 27, a day after he stated that he would not resign at any cost and fight till the last as he faces a no-confidence vote. Khan said that Muslim had been told to stand with good and against evil and his supporters must do the same. The parliament is slated to hold a special session on Friday to deliberate the no-confidence motion filed by the opposition against PM Khan with a vote in coming days. کہ آپ چوری کے پیسے سے پبلک کے نمائندوں کے ضمیر خرید رہے ہو قوم اس کے خلاف ہے Meanwhile, Pakistan's interior minister, Sheikh Rashid Ahmed, said that the country might move towards early elections but maintained that PM Khan would defeat the opposition's no-confidence motion. In the 342-member National Assembly, the opposition needs 172 votes to remove Khan. The PTI has 155 members in the House and needs at least 172 lawmakers on its side to remain in power. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi arrived in Kabul on Thursday, the highest level visit by a Chinese official since the Taliban took power last year. Wang met Afghanistan's acting Foreign Minister Amir Khan Muttaki upon his arrival and the pair held a meeting shortly after. Moving on, the Taliban has postponed the reopening of schools for girls because of a technical issue and a lack of standardized uniforms for students around the country. Backtracking on the announcement that high schools would open for girls, the U-turn took many by surprise on Wednesday, leaving students in tears and drawing condemnation from humanitarian agencies and rights groups at a time when the Taliban administration is seeking international recognition. Sixteen-year-old Khadija went to school on Wednesday, having stayed up all night in excitement after seven months at home in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul. But she had to return to her home in disappointment after the Taliban suddenly ordered girls' high schools to stay shut. The Taliban postpones the reopening of schools for girls because of a technical issue and a lack of standardized uniforms for students around the country, according to Suhail Shaheen, a senior Taliban member based in Doha. The U-turn took many by surprise, leaving students in tears and drawing condemnation from the humanitarian agencies, rights groups and diplomats at a time when the Taliban administration is seeking international recognition. A statement by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the decision deeply damaging. The UN spokesperson on communications in Afghanistan, Stefan Dujeric, read his statement on Wednesday. The de facto authority's failure to reopen school for girls above the sixth grade, despite repeated commitments, is a profound disappointment and deeply damaging for Afghanistan. The Secretary General says that the denial of education not only violates the equal rights of women and girls to education, it also jeopardizes the country's future in view of the tremendous contributions by Afghan women and girls. The last time the Taliban ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001, they banned female education and most employment. The international community has made the education of girls a key demand for any future recognition of the Taliban administration, which took over the country in August as foreign forces withdrew. 
Moving on, Sri Lankans are feeling the growing pain of the country's worst economic crisis in years, which has driven up prices of essentials and triggered shortages of everything, from food to fuel. In past three months, fuel prices have increased three times, while essential food items have doubled. 42-year-old Thusita Hadara Gama stood in a long queue of vehicles, trying to get into the petrol kiosks near his home in Sri Lanka's Minu Vangoda town this week, hoping to fill up his tank before the 40 kilometers journey to his work in capital Colombo. Across Sri Lanka, families like Hadara Gama are feeling the growing pain of the country's worst economic crisis in years which has driven up prices of essentials and triggered shortages of everything, from food to fuel. Hadara Gama is the sole breadwinner of his family, earning a monthly income of 181.82 US dollars, while working as a driver for a family, which has become unsustainable to feed his family of five. Historically weak government finances, badly timed tax cuts and the COVID-19 pandemic, which pummeled the tourism industry and foreign remittances, have wreaked havoc on the economy. On Wednesday, thousands of protesters marched through a suburb of Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, as anger grew over the worsening economic crisis. The Indian Ocean nation is battling a foreign exchange crisis that forced a currency devaluation and hit payments for essential imports such as food, medicine and fuel, prompting it to turn to the International Monetary Fund for help. Moving on, the third edition of Connect India-Nepal International Entrepreneurship Conclave attracted scores of startup entrepreneurs, investors and experts from both the countries in Nepal's capital Kathmandu on Wednesday. During the day-long event co-organized by India's embassy, Nepal's Minister for Communication and IT Gyanendra Bahadur Karki highlighted various investment-friendly policies to promote startups in Nepal. The event hosted three panel discussions with over 15 participants from both countries in each session and exchanged ideas and stories to fight the odds to become successful entrepreneurs. Around 20 startups were also mentored and trained by experts for nine days prior to the event. Farmers in India's Jammu and Kashmir are elated as their wheat cultivation along the de facto border with Pakistan has bore fruit and is about to reach harvesting stage with government's help. This comes as there has been peace at the border since the militaries of both India and Pakistan announced strict adherence to a ceasefire last year. Farmers in Katwa district of India's Jammu and Kashmir territory are elated as wheat cultivation on the zero line along the international border with Pakistan has bore fruit. The farming on around 141 acres of land between the border fencing and the zero line was restarted last December, reportedly after 20 years, with the help of Border Security Force, Civil Administration and the Agriculture Department. The locals in the area were provided with seeds, fertilizers and also tractors free of cost under the National Food Security Mission. The harvesting will be done in few days, officials said. We have given a lot of money. Now, there are four tractors in my village. They have given us a lot of money. 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 So, now they have given us a lot of money. Now, we are all happy. We are going to make a seed. 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 फसल आबाद कर सके इधर तो अगर शांति नहीं होगी तो कहाँ होगा जी इधर There has been peace at the border since the militaries of both India and Pakistan announced strict adherence to a ceasefire in February 2021 
Officials said the local farmers will be given more machinery on subsidized rates to cultivate the remaining land in the area. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash Asia Newsline and follow us on Twitter at Asia Newsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time tomorrow. Good night. Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India.